Greetings, people of God. My name is Emily Meyer. I'm an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and serve as the executive director of the Ministry Lab, a resource curating and webinar creating collective of the UCC, UMC, and Presbyteries of Minnesota. My friend and collaborator, Melissa Weinhandel, a marriage and family therapist associate and faith formation leader at Peace Lutheran Church of Plymouth, Minnesota, share this visual word in gratitude for the work of our colleagues who are serving their communities in so many new and sometimes exhausting ways. We have invited clergy to insert this visual word in the place of a personally prepared sermon, if doing so would help them care for themselves or their communities. Sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from our divine creator, from our savior the Christ, and from the life-giving, indwelling Holy Spirit. Amen. Images that inspire our imaginations are powerful. What a time to have Psalm 23 as our revised common lectionary appointed psalm. Who doesn't need these comforting, promising, hopeful images in the midst of a pandemic? The Holy Spirit works with incredible foresight sometimes. But I've wondered for the past 20 years just how relevant this psalm and many others can possibly be to contemporary, largely urbanized, non-agriculturally based peoples. 20 plus years ago in seminary, a Tibetan shepherd shared with our class just how challenging and dangerous solitary and arduous shepherding can be. He described for us the tricks of the trade and the realities of the landscape that make this psalm especially poignant. He elucidated just how trusting, and at the same time incredibly dim-witted, sheep can be. His personal presence and descriptions of the world of high mountain shepherding were an amazing opportunity that made this psalm take on much greater depth of meaning for me. But how many of us get to visit with Tibetan shepherds, let alone experience their life? which has long made me wonder just how relevant, or at least how collectively relevant, this psalm is. The psalm is attributed to King David, who was a shepherd, and it is easy to see why it resonated easily with people who lived their whole lives in, and descended from, a lengthy genealogy of herding nomads. But modern day Western folks, even those who grow up in an agricultural setting, have absolutely no idea what it's like to be a shepherd in the hills of a tiny, frequently war-torn kingdom in the middle of important Mediterranean trade routes. We manage to come up with creative ideas of what that might be like. We like to imagine that somehow even city folks can know what green pastures, still waters, and dark valleys look and feel like but really that's each of us superimposing our own realities on the metaphors of a shepherd king from 3,000 years ago. Not many of us are equipped to really get David's imagery. A helpful and fun exercise I've enjoyed in several of the congregations I've served is researching the psalm, what the most powerful images might have meant to David, why green pastures and still water were so important, what those dark valleys may have contained, We've dug into the Hebrew and learned that those last lines aren't as passive as they sound in English. God's goodness and mercy aren't just going to follow me the rest of my days. They're going to actively pursue me, which, by the way, helps us appreciate how frequently we are trying to outrun God's goodness and mercy, an image we don't get when we just read the English or when we don't understand shepherding. And dwelling in the house of my God isn't something that waits until after we die. It's a reality right here and now. Following investigative study, I've invited people to rewrite this psalm using the metaphors and images that speak most deeply to them. A nurse used nursing terms. My mom, a lifelong music musician, used musical imagery. A social worker colleague used metaphors of counseling and therapies. You might enjoy this exercise with whomever you're sheltering in place with. Let every person old enough to write use Psalm 23 as a template 
and rewrite it using language and images that speak to you from your experience. Non-writers can draw the picture or pictures that make them feel the comfort and promises of the psalm. One of my husband's ELL students likes to say, imagine, with a sort of sigh and sense of awe whenever he gets a new idea or learns something incredible or unbelievable. Let yourselves imagine the most comforting and peaceful images you can and write or draw them out. <clears throat> the challenge before us today is that even if we could all universally appreciate David's images in Psalm 23, we don't all get to experience the comfort they offer. While nearly every human on the planet is affected by this global pandemic, we do not all suffer in equal measure. We are most assuredly in a time of collective exile, wilderness, and storm. You can see last week's visual word for references to that. But some of us are enduring suffering in great disproportion to others' suffering. United Theological Seminary DMIN student, the Reverend Tanya Sadegopan, in her article, Poverty is the Pandemic, highlights the COVID-19 disparities in Rock County, Wisconsin, where African-American and Latino community members have been hit disproportionately hard, not only with infections, but with fatalities from this disease. Other recent articles are illustrating how lifelong poverty and the generational poverty cycle affect people's immune systems, making people who know poverty far more susceptible to catching and becoming far more ill from infectious diseases. Since people of color experience poverty in far greater numbers than white people, we are seeing grossly disproportionate numbers of people of color succumb to the COVID-19 virus, and far more people of color are dying from it. Some are using data like this as an excuse to deepen their racial hatreds and divides, calling this a black people's illness, and in their ignorance, believing that white people are exempt. Radicals are using data like this as evidence of God's hatred of people of color. The ignorance, apathy, and cruelty of these responses is beyond my comprehension. Nor can I come up with a pastorally appropriate answer to these voices, other than to quote Jesus from this morning's Gospel reading, when he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is on the side of God's children, all God's children, the sheep of the good shepherd's fold, having life and having it abundantly. Followers of Jesus, then, respond to the spotlight on our systemic inequities with love shared like our lives depended upon it. Followers of Jesus respond to learning the depths of our disparities with the word, imagine. This morning, the Spirit offers us a clear vision of, and a clarion call toward, a whole new life, a life of abundance for all, a life where God's goodness and mercy catch up with all those who are dragged down by our current systems of inequity and injustice. Early Christian life sounds rather bucolic and idealistic. Christians met in households and broke bread with glad and generous hearts. There was no hoarding, there was no stratifying and determining that some were to receive while others were not. There was living in a sense of communal abundance. No one went without because everyone shared what they had. When I shared this vision from Acts with my husband, the history teacher, a few days ago, he said, people did that because they believed the world was going to end any day. Okay, sure. They thought the world was about to end any second, so there was no need to hoard. They thought the world was about to end, so they wanted to look as though they had received the message, that they understood the teaching, that they believed that this was how God wanted them to live their lives. They thought the world was about to end, so they felt compelled to consume less and share more, work and live in just relationships with the least and the lowly, 
strive for equity amongst all peoples within their communities. They lived in Jesus' way because they were sure the world was about to come to an end. They lived in Jesus' way because any day now, the world they knew would end. And a whole new world, rich with God's abundance, would begin. Imagine. Well, the world as we have known it is about to come to an end. I feel like we should all say that together. The world as we have known it is about to come to an end. It can be really cathartic just to say that out loud. Let's admit this to ourselves. The world as we have known it is about to come to an end. We are in what Richard Rohr and others call a liminal space, the thin place between what has always been and what is about to emerge. I invite you to read Richard's excellent daily devotion from last Sunday if you aren't already a daily reader. This liminal space is going to be a time of grief, to be sure. There are drastic, massive changes, literally in the air we're afraid to breathe. The world we know is rapidly coming to an end. It's frightening. But it is disproportionately frightening for some members of our communities than it is for others. The end of the world as we know it is frightening to consider. Liminality is a shadow space full of doubt and concern and fear. But death invariably leads to new life. Liminal space is fearful, but also rich with possibility and hope and promise. The question before us, people of God, is can we, like the early Christians, see the end of the world coming and as a result, eat with glad and generous hearts? Can we, as sheep of the Good Shepherd, conjure an image of how God's new life might emerge so that everyone equitably experiences the goodness and mercy of God, so that all sheep are offered green pastures and led beside still waters. <clears throat> the best thing we can do in liminal space is sit still, be open, listen, and maybe dream a little. The best thing we can do in liminal space is join the Spirit in forging new images powerful images of hope and comfort. The best thing we can do in liminal space is sit still and let the goodness and mercy of God catch up to us. The best thing we can do in liminal space is rest beside still waters and allow ourselves to be filled to overflowing with gladness and generosity. Let's name our reality and not be afraid of it. The world as we know it is about to come to an end, but the Good Shepherd walks with us through this dark valley. Sit still, resurrection people. Rest beside still waters. Be fed and eat with glad and generous hearts and imagine the new life toward which the shepherd leads. Sit still, Easter people, and imagine. Amen.